Thank you guys for all coming. I got really excited. I was like, oh my god, there's so many people in this room. People want to hear me talk. You guys gave me a microphone. We're in so much trouble. Um, I'm Gina Rotolo. Um, I've no, I think I've seen, recognized most of you guys. Uh, I have been in the marketing and PR business in Houston for about 12 years now. Um, I focus mainly on special events, entertainment, and sports marketing, although I do a lot of other things with other clients. I have nonprofit clients and small businesses and startups. And I'm a boutique agency, which basically means I'm a department of one, an army of one. And when I get hired, I create a team that best fits the needs of that client. So it kind of keeps my overhead low and my ability to do a lot of different things. So if I'm not an expert in something, I can certainly find someone else who is, and then we create the right team, and off we go. Um, but today what I wanted to do is kind of focus a little bit on just some of the bigger events. Um, I think they're what people consider the sexy events. They're a lot of fun, and they look really cool, and they sound really glamorous, but I'm going to explain to you why that's not necessarily the case. Um, first of all, there are a few, uh, few key things to pulling off major events. Um, first and foremost, organization. Um, I like to call that the who's on first. Uh, teamwork, there's a plan, a message, then kind of the sexy part, which is the lights, camera, action, and then finally an event summary. So that's kind of what we're going to go through today and uh, definitely open to questions for, throughout the whole of this presentation. So anyway, without further ado. The biggest thing to know when you come into a situation, or for me, since I'm usually a supplemental support staff or someone that's been contracted to be part of an event or part of a team, is to know, their, know your client because their business just became your business. So it's up to you to understand everything and anything that they do in order to start putting the pieces of the puzzle together and start messaging it correctly. So that's the point where you want to ask every question. There is no such thing as a stupid question, I don't think, for the most part. Um, the big things, who, what, when, where, and why, it's everything that you're going to need to know because these are the things that the general public and the media are going to look to you to answer. So again, you need to immerse yourself and get educated pretty quickly. Um, then the other thing is, it's usually up to that marketing and PR person, as I find in my line of work, to sort of ask the important things like, what are the event goals? Is this a branding initiative? Is it about driving attendance? Is it about cultivating a new audience? What are we doing with this? So you need to keep those things in the back of your mind because as the course of the uh, event goes on, most everybody else loses focus and gets in their little silos. I heard everybody talking about silos earlier. They just focus on their department. So your job, most of the time, is to make sure that everybody understands the bigger picture, you're all still driving the train towards the same end goal, and that more importantly, you're keeping these questions relevant, not just to yourself and your team, but to the rest of the group. How I kind of do this is by putting together the right team. Um, events don't just happen. I think most of you guys know that, although there's this big myth, like with the Renaissance Festival, that on August, October 1st, we flip on a light switch, and voila, there we are. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and people make that happen. So you are not usually just an individual working on something, and I can't stress the importance of finding the right team and working with them. And these are my kind of my core steps of what I, my little mantra that I go through. It's called PACT. Um, Passion, accountability, communication, and transparency. Those are the four key things when I'm working with people. And if you can kind of keep those things in mind, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. You have to be accountable for everything you say or do. It's not a pass the buck kind of situation where it's, oh, that wasn't my responsibility because in the midst of major events, it's about making things happen. It doesn't matter if it's your job or not. I can't tell you how many times I get a phone, you know, someone says, hey, there's no toilet paper in this restroom. That's really not a marketing or PR function, but guess what? If I'm there, it's your job to answer the question. So be accountable, not just to your role, but to the event. Uh, communication, you got to talk to each other a lot. I'm one of those over communicators as opposed to an under communicator. So I'd rather there's too much information out there as opposed to not enough. And then transparency, always be open with what you're doing. That's a key to success and it's a key to avoiding any bumps in the road. That's my experience so far. Um, the other thing is if you're a team leader, you gotta delegate responsibility. Because if you have a team and you're not utilizing them for their strengths, you're just gonna make yourself crazy at the end of the day. Um, and I have learned that the hard way on more than one occasion. Um, and then the other thing is respect and trust your team to get the job done. These people are all together and they all know their roles individually fairly well, so you need to trust that they know what they're doing. I'm not a production manager. I'm not a sound guy or a lighting guy. I'm not the finance guy that has to keep the checkbook. I have to trust that they know what they're doing, but I also have to keep in mind that their role plays into a bigger, bigger scenario as well. And I couldn't just stop myself. I had to have a New Kids on the Block reference in here. I love boy bands. Um, the plan, uh, it's kind of piecing the puzzle together and I find that my role usually requires me to be the master puzzle putter together. 
Uh, first of all, the first thing I have to keep in mind in anything I do is budget. I used to think of budget as a four-letter word like fat, uh, but uh, it's not. It's, it's going to be the thing that guides you. You need to know where you stand with finances at all times. Because if you're the one buying media and all the, in charge of all these other things, trust me when I tell you that they want to know where every cent goes and they want to make sure that they're getting their value for whatever's being spent. Um, operation and logistics. Know your space. So once again, this goes back to it might not be your job fundamentally, but you need to know the area you're going to be in because people are going to ask you about it. Uh, production, which is the look and feel. So everything from your stage or your vendors, your maps, all that stuff, all comes together under production. PR and marketing, um, chatter equals sales. And usually when we're talking about major events, there's a ticket fee associated with it. It's very rare that I am involved in something that's free, although it happens every now and then. But it's usually about driving ticket sales and getting people interested. So you have to get people talking and make it part of the cool kid vernacular so people want to do it. Uh, ticketing, packages, discounts, and anything else that comes under a group sales function. Those are things you have to keep in mind because that's part of your messaging. Um, food and beverage, there's all, that's always an element at any major event or festival. People are always hungry and people are always thirsty, so you're gonna need to know about that. Vendors, which is all the fun stuff, so it's everything from if you've got a doggy daycare or you're showcasing, you know, we did um, the Midtown Block Party, uh, which turned into Best Fest this year, but that was all about showcasing businesses in the Midtown area. So those are your vendors. I think that's kind of the cool stuff. Kind of gives it a flavor and a personality. Uh, sponsorship. These people are incredibly important, as I've found in my line of work. These are the people that nine times out of ten are paying and footing the bill for everything that you're doing. So you need to make sure that the sponsors are adequately represented, that they're happy, that there's a fine line and constantly like your message being sponsor, sponsor, sponsor. So there's a subtle way to get those things in there. Give them the recognition they need because they're the people that constantly want the pat on the back. And then the other thing are partners. And these are everything from your media partners, your community partners, um, anything and everything else that helps you get this together and helps you spread the word. So that's kind of those are the main components of usually any major event that I work with. So the next important thing is getting the message out and how do we do that? So from, a, and this is kind of more the interactive side of everything and kind of what I, everybody thinks it's the cool fun part. It's also the part where you usually want to rip your hair out. So <laughs> you lose sleep over and you're tired all the time. But uh, marketing, most important thing, and a prime example with the Renaissance Festival, working with them. The Renaissance Festival has been incredibly successful for 36 years before I showed up. But the one problem they were having is they didn't know how to reach people in a modern, current way. You have to reach people in the manner within which they live. So just because you're a 16th century festival doesn't mean you can't utilize technology. Because right, they've been in the dark ages from marketing for many, many years. We finally got them hip and cool this year with they have a new website that Shipple did. Ooh, it's amazing, it's so pretty. Uh, and that became the foundation of everything else we did. It allowed us to really launch a social media platform. It allowed us to really use it as a marketing tool to communicate from a sales perspective, but just a general information perspective as well. So you gotta know how to reach people the way they live. And how do they live? What do we all do? Every day, probably get up and we check our phone first, right? Get on the internet. You're at work all day in front of a computer. The second you leave that computer, I don't care whether it's to go to the restroom or go to your car, you're back on your phone. What's going on? What's going on? Get in the car, listen to the radio. Maybe you listen to satellite radio. That's a different audience. It's harder to reach now. You're lucky if people go home and watch any of the news anymore. They're watching some TV, but there's a lot of DVR involved anymore because most of us are very busy. So how do we get to those people? So these are all the things you have to think about. Think of yourself, but then you also have to think of your target audience. So if you're in that 20 to 30 something generation, you're a little bit more online and hip and tech savvy than say like our parents or our grandparents. But these are still people that you need to reach for various events as well. So you really have to put yourself out of your comfort zone and think about how other people live and function and operate. And look to the people that you know. Look to your family. Look to your friends. Look to some of your coworkers. Just, you know, every, you've got a target audience and a, and a variety of people within the groups that you work with. So that's one of the biggest things. You have to have a message and a call to action. Putting an image up there, prime example, Renaissance Festival, they used to just have a knight on a horse. It didn't tell you anything. You're like, yep. Maybe it's the Renaissance Festival, maybe it's medieval times, I don't know. Um, so that's the whole thing, you have, to, you have to communicate something, so keep that in mind. 
Um, and then again, utilize online print, television, radio, and outdoor. Outdoor is an incredibly important avenue for a lot of events and festivals. It's usually not part of every, everybody's budget, but it's a great general branding. If you have an ongoing annual event, it's phenomenal. Just throw it up there with the dates and a website, and you're good to go. Um, PR. You got to tell everybody what's going on, event details, and again, a call to action. You want people to do something. You need to get the media interested so that they, in turn, feel like it's something important that the general public needs to know. So if it's, you have to come up with a lot of creative story ideas, and I think most of you guys probably know, but media people are inundated every day with thousands of emails, and every single one is some PR person that thinks they have the greatest story that's never been told. And half of them all are the same, and there's no creativity, there's no follow-up. Got to network and utilize your relationships, but you have to help them tell the story because it's not just their job anymore. Everybody in media wears so many different hats. There's been so much downsizing and changes of roles and responsibilities. The more work you can do for them to give them a finished product, the better your chances are of getting any coverage and getting the word out to the general public. So you got to kind of make it sexy and hip, and fun and interesting and not just hey we're having a wine event it's on Saturday you should come uh, there's pre-event day of and post event PR opportunities so it's from start to finish so just because you don't get covered ahead of time doesn't mean people won't come out the day of or even after you can still build brand recognition and awareness for your client through these three categories and I think people forget post event PR anymore. It used to be something that was very specific to social circles. So when I was working with the symphony and we'd have their annual symphony gala or magical musical morning, there were about 10 publications at the time you just submit literally. It was before we emailed everything. You'd take photos and you'd put, identify them on the back and send them out and they would maybe run them in their publication. But you would have to literally get all this film developed and send them out to different people. But again, that was one of the things, that was one of the only clients in a social sit situation that people utilize that. I don't think they do that that much anymore, and I think that's kind of a shame. We look to bloggers, we look to other people that are there on the ground to kind of help us with that and say, hey, I went, you should get, you know, if it's a two day event, we hope that they're going to talk about it on Saturday, so some, some other people will come on a Sunday. But again, I think it's kind of overlooked. Um, social media, I cannot stress how important this is. Um, case in point, um, most of you probably know that there are all these wildfires that have been going on up near and around the Renaissance Festival for the last about, about a month. We had another set in June. In three days' time, I attracted over 5,000 Facebook fans and 2,000 Twitter followers to the Renaissance Festival because that was the only outlet for instant communication. The counties didn't really have an organized emergency plan, and it was three different counties that you're dealing with. They were busy fighting fires that could not be contained. So it was up to me and my assistant that are in charge of the social media for the Renaissance Festival, and that became a viable outlet, not just for the people that lived in that community and the Renfest fans and staff, but also for the media. They were reporting things as seen, you know, it was as posted on Twitter today. So it was kind of cool, but we really did. It's a powerful tool, and again, Renaissance Festival never really utilized that before. For. Their social media was handled by a fan in years past, which means if you're not in charge of your brand and your message, look out, crazy people will do it for you. Uh, and it's going to be completely off target for what you're looking for. And you have people that it's, it, that's when the rumor mill really gets crazy, and the Renaissance Festival is a great example of that. Uh, but again, utilize social media. It's cheap, it's effective, it's fast, and it's the, it's the easiest way to kind of att attract the movers and the shakers. So don't forget about that. And you've got all these outlets with it. You know, there's the usual Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, YouTube. There's all sorts of other outlets that are coming out. I think probably 200 have probably just launched today in this time that I've been speaking. So know those things. Get to know them. Know what's useful to you because there is such thing, I think, as an overload. So you've got to use, you know, and I think that when you're looking at big festivals and events, whether it's South by Southwest or Austin City Limits, they're a little bit more cutting edge with their technology. But then you look at other things like the Bayou City Arts Festival or the Renaissance Festival or the Crawfish Festival in Old Town Spring, that audience is just still trying to get hip with Facebook and Twitter. So you don't have to inundate them. If you give them too many options, they get overloaded and they shut down. That's my experience. Um, the other thing is utilize uh, social media for contests and incentives. It helps you grow your database and your fan base, and it gets people engaged. So you're not just posting, hey, tickets went on sale today. There's something interactive and interesting. Um, and again, I think that's half the goal. It's not about how many followers or fans you have. It's what you're doing with the ones that you have. I'd rather have 200 people that care and interact with what's going on versus saying I have 200,000 and most of them just never look at the page or respond to anything. 
Um, and don't forget about grassroots. Grassroots is really effective still. I think people with social media have moved away from things like street teams and the old school go put out flyers and posters. Um, and that's my concert background coming in. I think that's still very valuable. You've got a lot of eager beavers that want to be part of the cool hip scene and they will work for tickets and that's really not that big of an expense for you. So give them the right things, send them out in a direction and you're going to see places all over you know, with your stuff. And I think that's incredibly helpful. I think people forget a lot about that. Um, but yeah, if the cool kids are talking about it and doing it, the other cool kids are going to show up too. So there's a little bit of that. There's a leader and a follower mentality. Capitalize on that. It's valuable for you. Um, partnerships. Again, cross-marketing strategies. So when you have your sponsors or your media partners, I don't just buy media. I like to leverage it for other opportunities. So if I've got $10,000 to spend, but I know I want to get fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of coverage what can we do to make a partnership and those partnerships stretch your budget and stretch your reach and it really doesn't cost that much more it's getting the right people involved so that your message gets out um, and again they have emails and websites and newsletters and everything else so they can help you with all these things and it basically you're getting those services as part of a trade and it's very valuable um, and again, if you have to paper an event, and in the concert business, I will tell you, I have had some real duds that I'm like, alrighty then, it's time for Marshall Tucker Band again, and no one cares. And you have to paper it. So when you have, some events are great. You never have to give a comp ticket if you don't want to. Comps do go a long way, but if not, utilizing your sponsors and your partners are great outlets for getting tickets into the right people's hands, not just saying I sent a quarter of a million tickets out into the marketplace hoping to get 10 people. You want to get the right people just the same. So it's a little bit more thoughtful and, and then at the end of the day you're likely to see a higher redemption. Um, so getting kind of the cool sexy part. So these are just some of the different events uh, and organizations I've been involved with um, to give you a little bit of a clue. I used to work, I used to run the downtown entertainment district and that uh, put me into a really interesting situation where I rode the sports and mar uh, entertainment and marketing wave for about four years. So I was the person in charge of the fan fest and all the VIP activities for the city of Houston, serving as a liaison to the NFL and our host committee for Super Bowl. So everything outside of Reliance Stadium was my problem. Um, worst moment ever in time, my cell phone number got printed in the Chronicle as a, for more information call. I had a $900 cell phone bill. I was 20 something years old and thought, oh my God, what do I do with this? So it was a little crazy. In addition to having international media here, I had, you know, literally like millions of people that were trying to call me every day. It was pretty insane. I should have gotten some like special prize or a golden cell phone from Sprint, but they didn't do that. Um, Anyway, so I did that. I've worked with the baseball and basketball all-star games, same thing. And those are fun, cool events, but these are all events that require you to work 20 some odd hours a day for weeks on end. It takes a lot to pull it off. And just because you're the spokesperson doesn't mean that all you did was show up and stand and look pretty in front of a camera, you know, for two hours. Usually, you know, you're losing your mind five seconds before the light goes on and you're like, okay, I'm ready. Is my lipstick on? Great, let's do this. Your phone's blowing up and five radios are exploding. Um, I do a lot of other festivals around town. Um, Autumn Art and Wine Festival, the Crawfish Festival in Old Town Spring. Um, they have a spring fest. Wine I like wine events, can you tell? <laughs> they pay you in wine bottles sometimes, it's awesome. Um, I worked with Sam Houston Race Park for several years. I actually was brought on to help uh, launch their concert product as well as kind of introduce a new audience to live racing. So I was with them for three years. We launched the Showgrounds, which was a joint venture between the racetrack and Live Nation, and we produced about 30 concert events a year, held warp tours, Ziegenbach Music Festival, a day in the country. So there's probably 30 concerts and about five to six festivals a year. So it kept me pretty busy on it in addition to just live racing. Um, so those are just some of the things, and people like to see that, so it looks cool. Um, obviously, Renaissance Festival. Um, this is the latest giant beast that I've been dealing with this year. Um, we open on Saturday. Most people are like, I can't believe you're here. I can't either. <laughs> oh my god, there's so much going on. I'm glad my phone's turned off. Uh, anyway, um, the Renaissance Festival had their largest attendance year ever last year. 450,000 people showed up. Um, this is an eight-week festival. It's 17 days of operation because we do two uh, school day events that are just, uh, the festival's closed to the general public and we welcome public, private, and homeschool kids. There are 25 stages. I literally have a cast of 500 and then all the other performers are arriving today from another festival. It's a cast of thousands. There are eight 
themed international villages, hundreds of dining and food options. And the bottom line is, when I came on, nobody knew anything about it. If you were part of the, the they call them Rennies. So I've dealt with rock stars and athletes. I'm now dealing with drama queens. It's amazing. <laughs> I may have found my niche. I'm not sure. Um, so this group, though, they've been using the same marketing for the last 10 to 15 years, which was very ineffective. They didn't have a way to use Their website was all flash. So for starters, none of us would ever see it on a phone. They kind of had a mobile site last year, but it didn't really tell you anything. Um, they, like I said, social media was controlled by, by fans and not by people inside the office. Um, and people just kind of knew the dates. So if you were one of the inner circle, you just knew the dates and you knew what to expect. But they stopped controlling their brand years ago, so no one knew what they were getting. So here we are in a situation where the entertainment dollar is very valuable, and you want to give people the biggest bang for their bucks. So it was time to kind of give it, I, I called it the Joan Rivers facelift. I mean, it was everything from head to toe. It's been redone. So I'm very excited this year um, with opening weekend coming up. Our ticket sales are up 85% before we even open, so I'm super excited. I think things are going well. Um, we launched all new marketing. We have brand new TV commercials that are running. We have a fantastic new website which served as the template for all of our new creative. We have advertising with purpose and a call to action. Um, and on top of that, it's, you know, it's kind of fun. It's kind of interesting, you know? It's never the same day twice. So if any of you guys, you all have comp tickets to come check us out. But uh, there's, we'll talk a little bit more about the Renaissance Festival. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions. Um, the other side of that with other festivals that I mentioned, um, again, everybody thinks that being in the music business is completely amazing. It's awesome, it's fun, it's sexy. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of babysitting. Um, when you're doing these festivals, which are you know, multi-act multi events, multi-stage events, multi-day events, like I said, you are living in a production trailer, if you're lucky, for about a week, in the dust, in the heat, with a bunch of smelly stagehands. So uh, it's not as hot and sexy to have that all access pass as people think it is. But at uh, the same point in time, it's been very interesting. You know, dealing with country music acts versus alt rock acts versus metal acts versus local bands. Um, you get a lot of egos involved in that. So it's about managing people. And it's about trying to be tactful no matter what you do and really just want to take five and strangle someone. So that's my other thing. I think when you need a break, you have to take a break so you don't kill the, right, you don't kill the wrong person. <laughs> Hopefully it's not your assistant. Um, so these are just some of the different events though. Um, I've, been, I've been involved with Warp Tour for six years. That's one of the most difficult tours I've ever worked. Um, you get on a bus and you leave and you're a bus with probably 35, 40 other buses and about as many vans and trailers and you show up in a parking lot at 5 in the morning and the stage gets, all eight stages start to get set up so you go to work at 5 a.m. You may have been asleep for two hours and then you spend the next 15 hours in the heat on asphalt in a parking lot with a bunch of smelly teenagers. So every year I remind myself that I might be too old and it's okay if I'm not cool anymore. I'm good with it. Um, but again, you're, you're managing you know, hundreds of different acts because every city there's new bands that are showing up and no one knows what to do and they're just there for a party and it's a good time and they play in the mud and in the rain and in the heat, they don't care. So uh, it's a little crazy, but it's like the largest version of Romper Room I've ever been involved with. Um, I'm proud to say that I survived it. Um, Kevin Lyman is a genius when it comes to putting these events on. He also launched a country version of that, which is a little bit more tame. But I have to tell you, after working with all these rock bands, I thought that country bands would be a lot more low key. No, they're worse. They like to drink a lot more Lone Star. Um, <laughs> I've done a lot of different festivals, uh, Hispanic Heritage Festivals, things like that. So again, you're getting different mix of people and a different way of dealing with them, but their message is all the same. They want to sell tickets and they want to sell fun. So that's how you have to look at doing those things. Um, these are just some of the different concert events to give you a scope and scale of what my days would look like. Um, Warp Tour, it's in, the, it's in the parking lot, it's dusty, it's dirty. Um, Willie Nelson's Family Picnic, 30,000 people. <laughs> 30,000 people to weed your way through between stages. And Willie Nelson backstage, never coming off of his bus. Um, <laughs> uh, a Day in the Country, that was a 20,000 person event and it was on multiple sides. So that's, you can see how far back that goes. That area actually holds 15,000 people. So that was a fun problem to handle day of when we'd oversold ourselves. Um, but that's the experience you want. People are having a good time. They want to be in front of the stage. They don't, they're there for one thing. They spent their money, they bought their beer, they bought their t-shirt, they want to have a good time. So that's what you're selling. And whenever you're having a stressful moment, remember, that's what it's like. 
We've all been at those events and we think it's really fun and cool. You want to have a good time. You want it to be seamless and easy. And so that's the best sign of success right there. Yeah, people showed up, but they're smiling and happy. Um, again, different, different act. there's Warp Tour, there's Willie, a lot of classic rockers, um, a lot of country acts. So just some different sexy pictures. And this is the big thing. There you go. That is backstage. You all want that all access pass, don't you? And that's what it looks like. So, and that's where you spend your life. And this is like a really nice one. I mean, there was AstroTurf involved in a bathroom. Um, but that's pretty much what your life looks like back there in between running to and from front of house and dealing with media crews and photo pits and everything else. So I've always, people always like to say, what's it like back there? Can I get a pass? No. <laughs> um, I think the best thing to remember that in doing large scale events, no matter what you put together on your timeline and you're super organized, from the second the gates open, throw the timeline away. It's never gonna happen that way. Nothing will ever go 100% according to plan, but it's how you react in those situations that you can't anticipate that keeps your team together. So someone has to keep their head on and keep cool, and not every, if you start out at a 12, there's no place else for you to go. Start at a one or a two that day. And then if the situation arises, get a little stressed, that's fine. But I think it's really important um, at the end of every event so you can learn, particularly if it's an ongoing event, with your team. You gotta recap the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everybody's gonna have their own war stories and wanna outdo each other at a table. But the bottom line is figure out what worked and went well, and then figure out where you can improve things. Um, again, the media summary report, report is incredibly important. As a contractor, I'm trying to get hired again the next year. So to me, if I can go and say, this is all the stuff we did for you, because you assume everybody's paying attention. Everybody gets right in their own workspace. And so if you're the CEO or the operations person or whatever, you're not really paying attention. You just know that tickets are selling and we're making some money and food and beverage is gonna be taken care of. So do something to get yourself hired again. Give them a reminder of the work that you did. So it's your collateral, it's photos, it's your press coverage, um, and importantly, metrics. Be able to measure what you do so that they can see the value in what they're paying you to be there for. So without further ado, here's some upcoming events. Yay. Uh, and of course, the Renaissance Festival. <laughs> Look at that one, it's big. Um, opening this Saturday, did I mention that? Uh, but yeah, if you, um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'm sure there, that's a lot of information, but um, I felt like maybe the, me the most beneficial part of this is you guys probably had some questions and feedback and wanted to know more, so fire away. Thank you. Yes. You know, it's, that's an interesting question. It depends on the event. I feel like, you know, an attorney, I'm like, it depends, it varies, I can't say yes or no. Um, circumstances usually do merit it. You know, when you get hired on, everybody has a certain level of expectation. What I find is the reason they brought me in is because marketing and PR is not their strong suit. Sponsorships may not be their strong suit. It depends on what you're doing. And I found that when I would start doing one thing, I was just hired to do your marketing and PR, and then they realized that I had sponsor relationships and I could build sponsorship decks and do fulfillment and all these other things. You increase your value, you take on more roles, so absolutely you increase your fee. Um, now the other thing to be mindful of is, you know, and again, if you're working with nonprofits, remember, nonprofits still have to make money to operate. So don't be afraid to price your services appropriately. And that's the other thing, because no one's gonna come to you and say, you did a great job, we should really throw more money at you. Yeah. They never will, I promise you. Um, and they're probably gonna scoff a little bit at, oh, you want more money this year? But you, again, show, you have to demonstrate your value and let them understand, you have to communicate why this is a good value to them, what all you're bringing. And you're bringing this, but you're doing so much more. So yeah, absolutely. I think you have to evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis, but I can tell you, you know, that when I've started with some of these clients and I've worked for them for you know, many years, our relationship has grown and changed and my responsibility has grown and changed. And um, you know, I've ended up with skin in the game in the same respect that so like Old Town Spring, I don't have a business there. I'm not gonna have a business there. But I am invested in that festival and that area as a, as a business owner in many respects, so it's, I care if they do well. I don't just do it and walk away. And that's the other thing, you have to have a passion for what you're doing and be involved in it. It doesn't have to apply to every single thing and you're like, this is what I wanna do. But at the same point in time, if you're not interested in what you're doing, your creativity slides, 
You're not gonna, I mean, you're gonna find other things to do. So I do think that you have to be invested and you wanna grow that relationship and you should grow your, your budget over that time too. Yes, Miss Monica. You know, it's a, it's a delicate balance for sure. Um, you know, when I write my contracts, it has room for some fudging, I guess, to, so to speak. You got to cover things like your expenses. I can't stress that enough. Spell all that stuff out. If you want mileage, if you're charging for copies, if you're charging for phone calls, whatever, like an agency. And the, end, the, the benefit to hiring someone that's an individual like me or smaller businesses is you're not going to get these astronomical agency fees. You get a project fee or a retainer to do it. Um, but within that, if we leave open-ended. So if at some point they say, you know, I really don't have time, or we don't have anybody else that knows this, can you do it? Depending on the situation, you do have to have an offline conversation and say, look, you know, this is really gonna take X number of hours away from what we've already agreed to. So do you want me to divide my time with this instead of what we originally talked about? You know, I can hand off social media to somebody else, or I can have somebody else manage these ad buys, but if you want me to come over here and develop a sponsorship packet or do some sales or whatever, you know, is it a percentage base to do that? But understanding, and you have to paint the picture for them because all they can see is you're capable, do it. And they just want to assign it and give it away. Um, but I think you do have to address that as you go along because if you wait till the end of it, you've kind of lost your negotiation power and the work is done. And remember, you have a value. Your time is valuable. Don't be ashamed of that. You have to be able in this type of work to say, this is my value and my worth. And I, and because no, like I said, no one's going to offer you extra money. You have to be able to put a price on your time because if you don't, nobody else will. So just kind of know your value and know your role. And if it's an area that you're not experienced with, I mean, in a million years, just because I eat in a restaurant doesn't mean I know anything about how that line of work happens. So if someone wanted to put me in, in charge of concessions, I'd be like, ooh, that's a bad idea. I know how to order beer. <laughs> I don't know what you do after it just magically shows up. So you got to know if it's an area that you're comfortable working in um, or if it's not. Yes. Yep. You know, I think that there's some, you know, one of the biggest things that's kind of what I think is an easy story on some of these events, and some people care and some people don't, people forget to talk about the economic impact of an event. So prime example, when you have something like Old Town Spring or the Downtown Entertainment District or the Super Bowl, these major events, it brings a lot of revenue to a very specific area. And it's not just the event that you're working on that benefits, it's these surrounding businesses that whether they're engaged or not, there's foot traffic. And Case in point, wildfires in Magnolia right now. Everybody's, you know, people have lost their businesses and their homes and all these other things. With a half a million people coming through Magnolia, which is the gateway to the Renaissance Festival, these businesses are finally going to get an opportunity to get jump started because they can make the bulk of their income across two months just by the people that are going through. If you're a guy that owns the gas station on the corner, you are in the money. You know, you're waiting in a two-lane traffic forever. If you're the Brookshire Brothers or if you're the, you know, they all, and there's ways that they find to get involved. Um, Old Town Spring, suddenly everybody's a crawfish expert and they're all out there in front of their, you know, antique shop selling, you know, sausage on a stick and crawfish. Um, but those are important stories because it does have an impact. Um, Houston Business Journal loves stuff like that. The Chronicle likes those angles. Um, you know, there's talk radio. Um, there's other things that you can develop off of that as well. But I think economic impact is one of the easiest stories to do in addition to other stories. Now, you can also jumpstart, you know, like ACL and South by Southwest. You never know what that lineup is, but the day after the festival's over, those tickets are on sale for next year. So what you start doing is you start building that hype as well. And if you have a following and you're a year after year event like a Jazz Fest or, um, or a CMJ, all these other big uh, Bonnaroo, all that stuff, um, and I've worked with all of them, you know, that's one of the first things we do. Our job is not over the second that last act stepped off, steps off stage. There's cleanup. There's how do you repair the area that you've just had all this traffic in. So there's several stories. Not everybody's going to be interested in them, but there's more to it than just here's some photos and here was the span and it was really cool. Yes. That's a good one. Um, you know, for years on the agency side, we used PR track. 
Um, and that fundamental program is still very helpful. I think it's more widely accepted than it used to be. Um, for me, you know, I, I know how much money I was given to buy advertising with. And that same space for editorial has a value because they could have easily filled it up with an ad. So typically it's whatever you spent. PR value is typically three times. Um, and that's based on the PR track model. But uh, I think, you know, for most people, they don't understand the metrics of that. If you're talking to an accountant, he's a dollars and cents kind of guy, and that's great. And you can actually, you can quantify that out for him. Um, I think what speaks volumes, though, is where were your ticket sales the year before? If it's a first time event, it's a little harder because you have to go in managing expectations and saying, look, Autumn Martin Wine Festival is a first time event. Spring Fest wine event's been going on for 13 years. Are we going to sell 5,000 tickets for a wine tasting on two, across two days? Probably not. But you know, we jump started it with a daily deal offer, and we sold you know 150 tickets, which for a first time event that no one knows anything about, pretty good. So as long as you can kind of manage those expectations, you should be fine. But really, people like to say, "Oh my God, we were on Fox this morning," or "Did you see that piece on Channel 2? Those things have value, and since you can put that video and utilize it forever in a day on you know through social media. It's recurring, it's no longer, I didn't see that at six o'clock in the morning and nobody else did either. So if someone's not up, you can still utilize it. So those things now with technology have really made the PR side of it stretch a lot farther. But people like to see TV and they love to see, you know, the Chronicle because it's the daily paper. They love Houston Business Journal because it can quantify your work. If you show up in the Wall Street Journal, but the big publications, whatever is important to that outlet, know what that is first and try and go get pieces in them. Yes. So you have this huge event, and the next day, the week after, how do you go about capturing all that? Like, where where you ended up online in the papers? Is there a source where you can say, other than Googling yourself? <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody likes to Google themselves, admit it. Um, you know, th yeah, there are several things, you know, and again, that's one of the services I offer my clients. There's the free Google service. You know, we can just plug in keywords and cross our fingers and hope we're going to get everything. I'm going to know major stories that are being placed or features, you know, feature advertorials. I know all that. But there's all the other small things you don't capture. Um, there are monitoring services that do that. Um, there's Cision, there's used to be Bacon's, there's um, Texas Press Clipping Bureau, um, all these services that literally they, and it's you know usually a cost per clip or a flat rate until you get X number of clips. They used to send you all this stuff in an envelope and we would make copies for days and put together a clip book. But now you can get them all in a PDF and it's all stored online so you can just ship it to anybody. Um, I'm doing that for the Renaissance Festival as a matter of fact through Cision right now and you know it's like a flat rate of I think hundred bucks a month and you know no matter how and it's unlimited clips so because I have an event that's regional and even national and getting that kind of coverage if I were to pay on a cost per clip basis oh my god that would kill me so c-i-s-i-o-n I think it's scission.us, if I remember correctly, is their website. But uh, they do a lot of services. You know, they are a database company, which again, if you're doing a first time event that's in a part of the country or world that you're not familiar with and you don't know that media, buy that database. Go and you can do geo target searches. You can use, um, you know, whether it's I want food writers or I want entertainment people or I want sports writers. The building the right list is 90% of the battle because if you're not getting media, your information to the right audience, who cares? You know, if I've got a, an event that, and all I'm doing is sending to sports writers and it has nothing to do with a the sport, they're going to delete my email and there's no point in, you know, they're not going to pass it on. You can't expect that people are going to pass it on to the, the features editor or the business editor. It doesn't work that way. I think it used to. It doesn't so much anymore. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. There's always a crisis, whether we talk about it or not. Yeah, um, actually, um, you know, I'm usually in charge of putting together the crisis plan or the emergency plan. Um, case in point with the Renaissance Festival. So now we have all these fires that are put out, but if we see, you know, 35, 40,000 people a day, what happens if a fire breaks out? We have to have an emergency plan. Um, we have to get 40,000 people safely off our property um, and out of harm's way. And those are things that require you to be very prepared early on. You start working early on with the fire marshal and city and county um, officials to develop a plan that they approve that helps and again that is going to start to incorporate you know with major festivals it incorporates so many other operations it's police it's fire it's city it's county um, all those organizations control different areas 
They control traffic. They control um, the lighting systems, They everything. So if you have a major catastrophic event that happens, case in point, the stage that fell at the rodeo during the Sugarland show, um, no one had a plan for if a stage fell, but there was a mass exit plan. Um, and again, that's how you avoid lawsuits, and it's how you get the majority of people safely out of the situation. But uh, it's up to me usually to be the front runner for that. I'm usually, in the, you know, I gotta train people to be spokespeople. You gotta know when to comment, know how much information to share, know what to hold back. But uh, it's, a viral, it's a vital part of any organization, absolutely. And that's all this stuff, again, that's not the fun, sexy part. People just wanna show up at the show and be like, yeah. But uh, you have to be prepared for that. Emergency crews are important to your operation. Anything else? I don't know how I'm doing on time. Five. Oh my God. Have I run out of things to say? That's impossible. Oh, tickets, everybody get their tickets, that's right. Um, yeah, well I hope you guys get to come to some of these events. Like I said, I've got the Renaissance Festival coming up. It's eight weekends long. Um, that's a, a monster of an organization to work with. It's pretty crazy and pretty fun. If you're not ready to dress up in a costume and step back in 16th century fun and get a little dirty, there's the Autumn Art and Wine Festival in Old Town Spring. There's a pet festival, which is kind of fun. You can, if you have pets that are interested in getting married, they're marrying pets at this festival. They're doing a wedding, I'm not kidding. Like, that was one of my favorite moments. I'm sitting in a meeting, I'm like, I'm sorry, how does that work? It's legal for pets? Hmm, that seems odd. So anyway, all sorts of fun events. And the idea is when you guys go to these things, you're supposed to be there to have fun. If someone like me goes to these events, I am scouring production. I'm looking at how things are running, how's it going. Um, you know, I'm interested. I can't, that's my geeking out. I like to see how things are put together. And uh, yeah, yes. Um, it's, it's usually a little bit of both. Um, when I go into a festival, they usually have an infrastructure of an operations person and a concessions person, um, the finance guy, usually a sponsorship person in, in some cases, a sales and marketing kind of guy. Um, so I do have a few people that I bring in with me, and again, I tailor it to each job. Um, if I go, you know, I, I'm not a designer. I always have my own designer that I can bring along and, because it, trust me, I mean, I have two logos on there. Are you kidding me? What happened with that? I don't design. Um, and again, that's knowing where your strengths are and where they're not. Um, but I do. I bring in, if I need to, someone that can book, I know that person. I know someone that can do sound and lights. So if they need those things, I can supplement. But a lot of these major festivals, when you go into something like an ACL or a South by Southwest, um, your role is pretty specific. And they've hired, it's a huge team, and they've asked you to handle a very specific part of it. Um, typically, when I do things like Jazz Fest or things like that, I'm just there. Uh, in a marketing and media relations capacity. So I have a bunch of meetings with all the other department heads and the people, you know, throughout the year there's a lot of conference calls. Everybody's across the, you know, scattered across the country. So there's a lot of video conferencing and conference calls, um, which is interesting because with technology you can get a lot more done a lot faster. You don't all have to be sitting in the same place. Um, prime example, this year, um, Lollapalooza. It's in Chicago, right? But C3 is based in Austin and that's the company that produces it. So we all do whatever, and when we get up there, it's like a little Houston and Austin you know, reunion. It's everybody that's, that we work with down here is doing that event up there. Which makes you not feel so weird. <laughs> it's like a little family, a dysfunctional family that needs a bath, but they're there. That's the other thing, body spray. Cannot stress the importance of body spray. And having that one person you can call and say, oh my God, I forgot X, Y, Z, Michael Copens. <laughs> and you can loan him out to other people as well. <laughs> He'll be your runner. You need a runner for sure. They, they work for tickets and free beer. So great. Well, thank you guys for letting me come speak with you today. I hope that giving you a little bit of insight on controlling some of the chaos. But uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be around for a little bit. So don't hesitate to come up and introduce yourself. Thank you.